therefore, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Our Majesty's Royal Life. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. This week we learned that Moochie Farms from Kingsville were planning to build another greenhouse. But because of the Liberal energy policies, they're going to set up in Ohio. The owner of the greenhouse said, I quote, if we had competitive electricity rates, we would be doubling our production here in Ontario. Moochie Farms won't be the last company to choose places outside of Ontario because of electricity rates. This must stop. These are jobs we want in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Agriculture is when will you ensure these reckless Liberal energy policies is going to stop driving greenhouses out of Ontario? First of all, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to welcome the new member from Niagara yeah, West Glanbury yeah. uh, to the Ontario Legislature. It is a, an extraordinary accomplishment to get elected at, uh, at 19 years old, and we look forward uh, to the new member making a contribution uh, to the debate here at Queen's Park. So welcome, sir. Good to see you. I want to, uh, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for asking me a question on agriculture. I think it's the first opportunity that he's been, since he's been here to ask a question about agriculture. Yeah, so let's, uh, Mr. Speaker. Let's set the context. Let's set the context. Let's set the context for agriculture in the province of Ontario. That was a a sector that contributes $36 billion to Ontario's GDP represents that 700. Was a compliment. Stop the clock. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell will come to order, and if he holds it up again, I will have it confiscated and ask him to apologize. I wasn't born yesterday. Minister, you have one wrap-up sentence. Mr. Speaker, a, a sector that contributes 790,000 uh, jobs uh, to the province of Ontario, and in last Thank year. You. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Agriculture. Um, first question about agriculture: Maybe the minister was asleep when we asked question after question on neonics. Uh, Memories. Now, back to my question, which he avoided answering. You know, we had Leamington's Nature Fresh Farms expanding a huge expansion yep. in Ohio, despite wanting to locate in Ontario. Exactly. Now we have Moochie Farms yep. setting up again in Ohio, despite being an Ontario family, an Ontario business that wants to invest in Ontario. We've got no Both are ignoring Ontario and choosing to locate elsewhere because of reckless Liberal energy policies. Yeah, sure. For 13 years, you've led us to this point. You're driving businesses right. out of Ontario. Yep. So, Mr. Speaker, rather than Liberal talking points and spin. What are you going to do to keep these agriculture jobs in Ontario? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Without the editorial, please. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Leader of Opposition. For the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, the member from Leeds Grenville, come to order. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for his second question on agriculture that he's posed here. <laughs> so let me tell you, it's a bit rich not for better. this side to ask a question about agriculture. When they're in office, they closed 52 offices around the province of Ontario. Oh. You know, that's the reality. That's true. So let's, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let's. We have more jobs than ever before. Tell us about agriculture. Mr. Speaker, let's, let's talk about some facts here. In 2015, the farm cash receipts of the province of Ontario were $15 billion, a record in the province of Ontario. We created 42,000 new jobs in the province of Ontario. This is a sector that's growing with the support of this government Thank you. each and every day. Of the Thank you. It's uh, starting to elevate, and uh, I'll repeat yesterday if needed trying to give you an opportunity to control yourselves. Final supplementary. Mr. Uh, Speaker, back to the Minister of Agriculture. And in fairness to the Minister of Agriculture, he is the best Minister of Agriculture that Ohio has ever seen. Yeah. His, his, work, his work in supporting ag jobs in Ohio is impeccable.
impeccable. But I'm concerned about Ontario. You know, you look at the government's promise of natural gas expansion, and you know, there's no no action here. You're preventing investment in the greenhouse gas industry. It's cost investments. Let let me read a quote from Stuart McFadden. Chatham Kent's Deputy Director of Economic Development. He estimates that 300 acres of greenhouses were not built in his municipality over the past few years because there wasn't adequate natural gas infrastructure in place. They lost 300 million of investment because of this government's dithering. You talked about natural gas expansion. You're already hurting the greenhouse industry Question. because of electricity. When will you honour your word and actually make sure that expansion happens? You just about killed Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the leader of his opposition for his third question in agriculture today. <laughs> and let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, Mr. Member from Leeds Grenville, second time. Finish, please. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you, he's the best spokesman that New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Louisiana, California has ever had. We on this side, we on this side are promoting Ontario each and every day. Through very aggressive trade missions, whether it's to China and India, there's an increased demand right around the world for products and products and agricultural products that are produced right here in Ontario. In 2015 alone, 42,000 new jobs in this sector. Whether it's the greenhouse sector, Answer. whether it's primary agriculture, whether it's the processing sector, it's a good time to be in agriculture in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, since there's no point of asking questions to the Minister of Agriculture because he won't answer them, I'll try the Minister of Finance. And, you know, tolls, tolls are making life harder in Ontario, more expensive for the people of Ontario. It won't make life any easier, that's for sure. According to the City of Toronto's own study, just over 13 per cent of drivers who will use the DVP and the Gardener will be diverted to other areas. The City has said that some of the drivers may take public transit, but the majority will find a another route on a surrounding road. David Pritchard, the chair of the Mimico by the Lake Business Improvement Area, said it doesn't take much traffic to really completely block the streets. We're going to see more traffic, more congestion in the City of Toronto that we can't afford. So, Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance, can he back up to the House why he thinks tolls are the right thing for Toronto? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate uh, the member from Darfield. What was Darfield's riding again? Oh, Simcoe North. Simcoe North. That's right. Mr. Speaker, the the previous Mr. Speaker, the previous leader of the Progressive Conservative Party has been putting forward some solutions with their knowledge and I presume support in order for the city. And as the member opposite knows, uh, the City of Toronto has yet to determine what it is they're going to do, and I'm sure that the Progressive Conservative Party is dealing with their former leader to determine how best to proceed. We on this side of the House will look at what those solutions will be when and if ever they are proposed. Mr. Thank Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, back to the Minister of Finance or the member for gas plants, if I recall. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I will inject myself in this only in so much as uh, you give, you get. Except to say this, there is a standing understanding here that we refer to people by their writings and only their writings or their titles, nothing else. And that includes questions from the members on the government side with regards to aggrandizing the ministers. So I'm going to ask everyone to just bring it down a notch and just get this thing done the way it should be done. Please. Mr. Speaker, a toonie may not sound like a lot to the minister, 
But according to a fair driving study that was published on driving.ca, they expect the tolls on the DVP and the Gardner could be as high as $12. Knowing the government's past and their history of having prices skyrocket, you know, I'm very concerned that this is going to make Toronto and the 905 unaffordable Order. commuters. I know this is a sensitive spot for the Liberal benches because they can't defend these Liberal tolls. So once again, my question to the Minister of Finance is how does he justify tolling the DVP and the Garden? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member opposite reminding everyone that I fought hard for my community, and I always did, right from the very get-go, right through to the end, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud of that, and they followed suit, Mr. Speaker, and they failed. We delivered on this side of the House. Furthermore, he's talking about toll roads, toll roads which he forgot that he actually sold, because somehow he didn't remember, like he didn't remember that he supported the health curriculum, then didn't support the health curriculum, then did so, then did not. He has no idea as to what's going on, Mr. Speaker, because they sold the 407. That's a billion dollars annually that we lose to this side of the House, and that costs every Ontarian in this House. You see there, please? You see there, please? I'm. Uh, Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, um, back to the Minister of Finance. The DVP and the Gardner are necessities for commuters. They don't have a choice. They need to go to work. They are too important. They are far too important for this government to use as a cash grab on hard-working commuters. Mr. Speaker, this is an attack on commuters. It's not just the mayor of Mississauga that has expressed reservations. We're hearing, we're hearing reservations across the 905 in the city of Toronto. So once again, for the third time, Order. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Finance is why is he giving the city of Toronto permission to toll the DVP and the Gardner when commuters can't afford it? Thank you. The member from the Tobacco Lake shall come to order. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the third question from the leader on this particular topic. I think we covered this ground yesterday here in the legislature. Uh, both myself, the Minister of Finance, everyone on this side has said, of course, if the City of Toronto has a formal plan with Council approval, the government will review that plan very carefully. But, Speaker, we also covered off a couple of other important topics yesterday in this same realm. Number one would be that our government has the most ambitious transit and transportation expansion plan in Ontario's history. We are making unprecedented investments in transit and transportation infrastructure in Toronto, in the GTHA, and right across the province of Ontario. Speaker, we're going to continue to do that. We also did cover off the fact that we have yet to see a plan of any kind from that leader or that caucus with respect to how they would continue to build up transit and transportation here in the province of Ontario. The Minister of Finance referenced Answer. the fact that on this particular topic, on this particular topic, Speaker, it was that leader's party that sold the 407 in 1998 for 100 years. Thank you. For 100 years, Speaker, we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Your question, the member from Bramley, Gore, Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Acting Premier about people whose hydro had been cut off, about small business who were forced to relocate to the U.S. and often, in some circumstances, shut down entirely. And every time I asked these questions, the Minister of Energy stood up and said, everything is fine. The government's working and the government's doing a great job and everything is fine. Can the government explain how the Premier on one side says that she's made a mistake, that there's a mistake, there's a problem here, but the Minister of Energy thinks that there isn't a problem? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased to always stand up and talk about the great programs that we have in place to actually help small businesses um, with some of their energy costs, Mr. Speaker. And we recognize the importance of small businesses. I know yesterday we met with uh, many of the chambers from Northern Ontario to talk about the importance of the, the NEAR program, Mr. Speaker. That's helping many of our industries throughout the North. But we also recognize, Mr. Speaker, that some of those industries in Southern Ontario need support as well. 
That's why we brought forward the 8%, Mr. Speaker. That 8% reduction is actually helping many of those small businesses. And also last week in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker, I worked with the FASCO, creating 81 jobs. They're reducing their energy usage and saving themselves over $100,000, Mr. Good Speaker. Work. That is fantastic work that we're seeing on this side of the House that's going right across the province. There are many programs in place that help, but we know we've got more yes, work sir. to do, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we're doing. We continue to work to find ways to help businesses right across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the cost of hydro is making people feel like they can't build a life for themselves and they can't see how the next generation is going to have a future. When they see local companies forced to relocate to the states, and when they see local companies shut down, they don't see how they see jobs leaving and they don't see how the next generation will have jobs here in this province. Instead of providing help, instead of actually doing something concrete, the minister just keeps on responding by saying everything is fine, there's no problem here. There is a problem. People are struggling. Businesses are suffering. We need to do something about it. And the sale of Hydro One is only making the situation worse. Will the government commit today to finally ending any further sale of Hydro One? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When we're talking about the next generation, the next generation can be proud that they actually can go outside and breathe clean air. We've eliminated coal, Mr. Speaker. We're meeting our GHG reductions. Seven million cars, Mr. Speaker, have been taken off the road because of our closing of coal plants, Mr. Speaker. That's actually seen um, health care, uh, air pollution deaths and hospitalizations drop by 23 percent and 41 percent, respectively, Mr. Speaker. That's doing a lot for the next generation, but we know there's more work to do, and that's why we brought forward the 8% reduction with the HST, Mr. Speaker, permanently reducing that off of the hydro bills. And when it comes to small businesses, Mr. Speaker, the ICI program is actually going to help over a thousand new businesses across the province lower their electricity rates, lower their GHGs. Because you know why, Mr. Speaker? We recognize Answer. that reducing GHGs, creating jobs, and lowering rates is something that this government will do for the next generation, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, the Premier promised that she would be different. She made people believe that she would be different. And what happened is she's letting down families just the same way. In fact, she's letting them down even worse. She's not only letting down families, she's also letting down small businesses in this province. Who want, these small businesses want to hire, they want to grow, they want to innovate, but they can't even stay open, let alone try to do these innovative things. Nobody voted for this. Nobody voted for 60,000 people to be cut off from Hydro One. No one voted for this government to sell off Hydro One in the first place. When the Premier finally told Liberals that she'd made a mistake, does that mean that she understands that selling off Hydro One is a mistake and that she's going to commit to not selling off any further stock of that city? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, when it when it comes to the the broadening of uh, of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, we we know that it was a tough decision, Mr. Speaker. That's why we do the heavy lifting on this side, Mr. Speaker, because we know that the investments that we're making in infrastructure are creating jobs and building Ontario up. And the and the the sale of Hydro One, as everyone in this house knows, Mr. Speaker, has no direct link with the increase in rates, Mr. Speaker. We know that the OEB just made a decision two weeks ago that didn't see an increase in rates. But when it comes to Hydro One, and the broadening of the sale and the investments that we're making, Mr. Speaker. I can talk about what happens right in just my own riding of Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. Maley Drive, $26 million investment by this government to expand Maley Drive in Sudbury. We've got many other things happening throughout the Northeast, many other great infrastructure projects that are happening right across our great province, Mr. Speaker. And that's yes, with the great investments being done by the Minister of Transportation, the Minister of Infrastructure. We recognize that there's a lot of work to Thank do on you. this, and we're building Ontario up and creating. Thank you. New question to the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Deputy Premier. The Minister of the Environment and Climate Change promised to clean up the English Wabagoon River system to the satisfaction of the Chief and to the health of the people. But the Premier won't start the work because she claims the science isn't in. Scientists say, quote, that fear is needless, and quote, we think, and other scientists think, these cleanup methods are benign and won't cause any damage to the ecosystem. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. Will you listen to the science and start the cleanup of the English Wabagoon River system? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I had a private conversation the other day with the member opposite to explain in some detail what's going on. 
And let me just reiterate, Dr. Rudd was funded by the Ministry of Environment through the First Nation to undertake the study. The study, Mr. Speaker, I have in my hand. The study asked for about $600,000 worth of very specific work outlined in Chapter 7, which is being done right now. The agreement, which is now concluded and we, are just, we expect to have it signed by the chief any day now that hasn't held the money up from signing, is to present these options and the risks of the different types of interventions that Dr. Rudd Asked Answer. That will be finished by June. It will be presented to the community, and the community will make the choices of which interventions Thank you. they want to do. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I, I'm glad that that matter was raised. I'll go back to the Deputy Premier. Dr. John Rudd, whose research and recommendations are what this government has to go on, says the cleanup can safely get underway today. But the money 300,000 this government says it's invested in field work hasn't arrived. My question, will the acting premier tell this house on the record how much of that $300,000 has actually been released? Minister. This partnership under the agreement of the political accord between First Nations and the government requires that we cannot spend or act in a First Nation without the consent and agreement. We have had three meetings now on the political committee that, that Minister Zimmer and I sit down with the chief. The agreement now is finalized. It is literally rating one signature. The First Nations negotiated in good faith. We think that the agreement is solid. I have asked for an immediate meeting with Dr. Rudd because in his, re in his report, he advised caution and specific measures to be taken. If he is now of the view that this can move ahead more quickly, we will not hesitate to advance the agenda. The only reason we haven't advanced the agenda more quickly Answer. is because we have to finalize the agreement with the First Nation, money has already been flowing to cover their bills, and we've been taking Dr. Rudd's advice. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, notwithstanding that, I thought we would actually get the number. However, I'll go on to my next question. Deputy Premier, as you well know, enough is enough. When will this Liberal government start the cleanup of the Grassy Narrows area so that the fish are safe to eat? Thank you. Minister. So if the member opposite would like the number, we have received $20,000 in bills from the First Nation, which have been paid in full. I have not received a single bill or cost yet from any of the research teams, which are actually out there working right now. If we did, we'd advance the money. As of this last couple of days, what I think we now have, we're just waiting for one signature, all of that money will flow. The $300,000 that we are spending directly is already being flowing, so the vast majority of the money is either in play or being spent. What has to happen? What actions should we do? Should we do extraction? Should we do covering? Which of these should we do? I will say again. If Dr. Rudd's advice, who we have great respect for, and I can read through Answer. the nine measures that he's recommended and the work plan that he wrote that we're actually following on a daily basis. If he wants to Thank revise you. his advice, we will accept that advice. Thank you. New question. A member from Niagara uh, West Grand. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the people of Niagara West Glanbrook for giving me the privilege to represent them. It's an honour uh, to stand in this house. My question is for the Minister of Health. The hardworking people of my riding have fought for the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital in Grimsby for years. In fact, the community fundraised $13.6 million to put towards the project. Sadly, in 2012, this Liberal government cancelled the project they promised in 2011. It's been four years since the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital project was shelved. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Health commit to the people of Niagara West Glanbrook and give the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital the funding it deserves? Thank you. 
uh, again without the editorials, please. <laughs> Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm honoured to be the recipient of the first question from the member <laughs> from uh, Niagara West Glanbrook. And I welcome him to the legislature and appreciate this question. Um, and it's important to mention that all of the candidates in the recent by-election made uh, specifically made the imp uh, reference the importance of building health care, including supporting uh, and furthering the infrastructure and the delivery of health services through the West Lincoln Hospital. They made it a priority during the campaign, as did the member opposite. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is a critically important health service that provides services to uh, individuals in that community. That's why we've increased their funding this year. That's why, in fact, just recently, as recently as last week, I announced in the $140 million additional dollars that go to operating expenses for hospitals. That included in that list is, is the uh, West Lincoln Hospital through the Hamilton Health Sciences, because, of course, Hamilton Health Sciences is responsible Answer. for the management and administration of that hospital. They do have some very real infrastructure needs at that hospital as well. And I know my ministry is working closely with Hamilton Health Sciences and the West Lincoln Hospital, Mr. Speaker. Supplement. <laughs> Back to the minister. The people in the riding I represent held fundraisers for over a decade to help raise funds for the hospital redevelopment. But this Liberal government made a promise to, these pe to the people of my riding in 2011 and then turned their backs on them in 2012. So it's time for the Liberals to honour their commitment. It's time to stop playing politics with people's health, and it's time to get this project the funding it deserves. Mr. Speaker, when will the minister announce the promised funding? for the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital. Thank you. I've, uh, now we're getting evidence of why I ask you not to say anything when I'm standing. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I believe the member will agree that uh, because uh, the West Lincoln Hospital is part of Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, we're working closely with them and the leadership at West Lincoln. Uh, Hamilton Health Sciences is putting together a proposal where they're prioritizing their infrastructure investments, uh, which of course is uh, including the West Lincoln uh, site, uh, Mr. Speaker. But it's important to, to reference. So we've increased the funding for Hamilton Health Sciences, including West Lincoln, for 10, by $10 million just this year. We gave nearly $5 million specifically to West Lincoln earlier this year for infrastructure uh, and other upgrades, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so we are working working uh, hard, and we've made unprecedented and will be making unprecedented investments, $12 billion over the next decade for infrastructure. I look forward to working with the member from Niagara West Glanville yes, uh, as we look at the Hamilton Health Sciences uh, proposal for infrastructure going into the future. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Acting Premier. As Speaker, buried deep within the government's fall economic bill are changes that will put the health and safety of tens of thousands of workers across Ontario at risk. These changes completely ignore recommendations from a 2010 expert panel report on occupational health and safety. And in an email, the government says this will remove, I quote, the burdensome processes like routine inspections. This is why there are 3,000 people on the front lawn of Queen's Park. We've heard from hundreds more of concerned workers and labour groups over the last week appalled at these changes, shocked that no consultation took place with those who have the most to lose. Will the government do the right thing and ensure that the tens of thousands of workers across our province are protected while they're at work and remove these schedules from this finance bill. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that very, very important question. Speaker, the health and safety and protection of all Ontario workers is a top priority and it's a focus at the Ministry of Labour. I'll tell you what the member is talking about is the accreditation process, Speaker, and the objective of an accreditation or an employer's recognition process is to enhance the delivery of health and safety services in order to enhance health and safety within the workplace. If passed, Speaker, if this uh, proposed legislation is passed, what we have in accreditation is a potential to benefit Ontarians and to all those who work in the province, Speaker. It's going to empower business to 
improve their own internal health and safety, Speaker. What it does, Speaker, it's proven to improve health and safety within companies, Speaker. It saves lives. It prevents injuries. We on this side of the House support this. I can't for the life of me imagine why the NDP would not, Answer. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, what this government has done is that they have forgotten that you cannot build Ontario up without the work of skilled trade workers in the province of Ontario. And, and Mr. Speaker, this isn't speculation. It was in a note from senior government staff the same day that the bill was introduced that these changes will reduce the burden of unnecessary processes like routine inspections. The research and the evidence-based data is clear that workplace health and safety is better with more, not less, enforcement. In fact, the Non-Governmental Institute for Work and Health reports that, I quote, employers do take steps to prevent work-related injuries for employees when there are direct consequences to them. Speaker, will the government do the right thing, make workplace safety a priority, and reverse its decision to start privatizing workplace health and safety in Ontario? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the supplementary. It is a very, very important issue, Speaker. What this will allow the, MLO, the MOL to do, the Ministry of Labour to do, is to focus resources on the places where we need to focus on, the places where the injuries are taking place, the places where the fatalities are taking place. And, Speaker, I know the member talked about research. She might want to do her homework, Speaker. Oh. Three Canadian jurisdictions have accreditation processes in place. You've got Alberta. You've got British Columbia, you've got Nova Scotia. Clearly, Speaker, when those, when those programs were put into place, health and safety improved, Speaker. Incidents went down. Increased hazard reporting took place. Wait, reduced wait, rates of lost time injuries, Speaker. Improved health and safety environments. These are all things, Speaker, that we want for the health and safety of workers in this province. Answer. Instead of making chief political points, Speaker, she might want to put the health and safety of workers in the province of Ontario first, Speaker. Thank you. Stop, stop. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Start the clock. Start the clock. Order. Order. The member from Kitchener Waterloo will come to order. Minister of Agriculture will come to order. New question. The member from Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Children and youth who come into contact with the youth justice system have unique needs. We strongly believe in the importance of rehabilitative programs in a safe environment that help our youth successfully transition back into their communities. One such facility that aids this process is the Roy McRutry Youth Centre, a 192-bed facility located in Brampton. We recently announced that the Ontario government is repurposing this centre. Minister, why is the Roy McMurtry facility being repurposed? Thank you. And Mr. Children, you serve it. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Brampton West for this important question. And I know the uh, Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services uh, will want to uh, weigh in on the second part of the question. Mr. Speaker, here in Ontario, between 2003 and 2015, we saw a youth crime uh, rate drop by 46 per cent. Mr. Speaker, I think that's great news uh, for everyone here in the Legislature today. It means that our youth strategy here in the province of Ontario is working. Our strategy focuses on prevention and diversion programs, and uh, we're moving uh, young people away from formal court proceedings into diversion and alternative programs. And a diversion program can include job skill trainings, mental health treatment, family counselling, and education and tutorial services. As a result, Mr. Speaker, we have seen an 81 per cent drop in youth custody admissions here in the province of Ontario since 2003. Yes, 
Mr. Speaker, uh, the repurposing of this facility is good news for Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My next question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. That youth, just, justice, uh, youth justice admissions have declined over 80 per cent since we came, came into power is a testament to the successful rehabilitation and reintegration programs our government has put in place. In turn, it frees up space within our adult correctional system, where I know the Minister is working very hard to address the to address capacity challenges and provide supports for individuals with mental illness. I understand that we have hired 36 dedicated mental health nurses in facilities across the province since 2013 and are partnering with CAMH and others to provide specialized mental health training for correctional officers. Can the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services please expand on what the Roy McMurtry what the Roy Mc Murtry means Question. for correctional trans transformation and for our efforts on behalf of those with mental illness. Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Brampton West for uh, asking about this important issue. And I also want to commend the Minister of Children and Youth Services for his leadership on this issue and uh, working with our ministry uh, across ministries to uh, develop what will be a uh, welcomed addition uh, and a centre that is much needed in the province of Ontario. This 192-bed adult female detention centre is part of the uh, conversion for the Roy McMurtry Youth Centre, which will also include a much-needed 32-bed mental health unit for female inmates. It will be opening in 2018, and it will in fact be the first dedicated female mental health unit in the province of Ontario. The additional 192 beds is the latest step as part of our transformation of our correctional system and investments that we're making, adding to nearly 380 new beds that we've created with facilities in Windsor and sir. Toronto, as well as the 112-bed Regional Intermittent Centre in London. Speaker, This is part of our investment strategy and modernization of corrections in Ontario. Thank you. Question, the member for Ladder, for Atlantic, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. There are thousands of skilled tradesmen and women who have traveled from across this province, lost a days of wages to be here to protest against Bill 70, Schedule 17, which threatens their livelihoods and their careers. These skilled tradesmen feel that this government has betrayed them and has stabbed them in the back with Schedule 17. It will take the decision-making and determination of scope of work and recognition of their trades out of the hands of the college and puts it into the hands of the OLRB. Speaker, will this government take Schedule 17, pull it out, and throw it in the trash where it belongs? You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Speaker, I appreciate the question coming from the member as he stands up for unionized skilled trades in the province of Ontario. Certainly, I want to thank him, Speaker. It's something that we weren't expecting today. But I do want to acknowledge, Speaker, the men and women that join us on the front lawn of Queen's Park today to express an opinion, Speaker. What we're doing at the College of Trades is we're implementing procedures that have come out of uh, the Dean report. We've implementing procedures that have come out of Chris Bentley taking a look at the College of Trades, Speaker. Speaker, the College of Trades is, a, is an organization that brings all the skilled trades in the province of Ontario together. There's some tough negotiations going on, Speaker, as this college seeks to establish itself and promote the skilled trades in the province of Ontario. What we saw today, Speaker, was part of a healthy discussion that we're having with skilled trades around the province. That, that, uh, that's going to continue, Speaker. We're going to reach a resolution on this, I'm convinced. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Minister, uh, a healthy discussion requires two parties. You weren't out there, and nobody else in the Liberal Party were out there. This government is in a rush to ram legislation through, and it's been their stock in trade all the time. It is disrespectful of the people of Ontario. It's disrespectful to the thousands of people who are on the front lawn of Queen's Park today. 
Speaker, it's both incredulous and absurd that this minister would place the determination of scope of work and trade recognition into the hands of the, the OLRB. It's wholly unsuited and it is prejudicial to our skilled trades. Speaker, once again to the minister, will you stand with our skilled trades out there with them and take Schedule 17, pull it out, throw it in the garbage and stand up for skilled trades? Please. Start the clock. <clears throat> you won't know when I'm going to strike. So why don't you stop? Minister of Labour. Speaker, thank you very much again for the question. But let me put the, let me be clear, Speaker. If there's any individual member in this house that has stood in the way of the College of Trade, Speaker, since its inception, it would be that member, Speaker. They've opposed the College of Trades every step of the way, while skilled trades in this province, while the men and women were seeking the same determination in their jobs that professions have, that doctors have, that lawyers have, that nurses have. This member did not want the skilled trades to have a say in their own future, Speaker. He felt somehow they couldn't do it, Speaker. What they're asking us to do today, Speaker, and I won't do it. What we want to do, Speaker, is enshrine risk of harm as a key recommendation for college enforcement, Speaker. That is going to keep people safe. Order. That is going to respect scopes of practice, Speaker. There's a lot of questions the on member the from Lanark, from order. And certainly there should be questions. Answer. But coming from that member, it just doesn't bring truth, Speaker. New question. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Walk by heckling is not allowed. <laughs> New question. The member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, uh, this government has been consulting with stakeholders in the beverage alcohol industry for three years. For three years, they've heard from Ontario's craft distilleries. They have heard that this small group but growing industry needs a competitive environment in Ontario, and they need a graduated rate of taxation based on the leaders produced rather than the bottom not unlike what Ontario's craft brewers have. The Premier's right-hand minister, Ed Clark, has been having conversations, engaging in dialogue and discussing. Bill 70's changes to uh, spirits taxation will destroy a small, growing, local farm-to-glass industry. Can the Premier explain why her advisors and her government ex ignored what craft distillers have been telling them? Thank you. Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. Recognizing, of course, how important uh, the distillers are, as well as our wine industry and our cider industry, our beer industry, all of which are providing jobs and creating more opportunities for the province of Ontario. And as the member opposite noted, they are having an existing system today, which we're trying to, the member we're trying to improve. In fact, time. their current share is around 39 percent per bottle, Mr. Speaker. As we implement the changes that are being proposed, they'll be getting a greater percentage. In case you didn't hear it, you have a second time, and now that's the third time, which means it's a warning. Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are improving the supplier's margins here from 39 percent to 45 percent. We're making Sir. it better, and we recognize that there's some more that they would like to do, and we're having those discussions as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the government can claim that they're helping out the craft distillers, but this is what the craft distillers themselves are saying. Charles Benoit of the Toronto Distillery Company said that his distillery will be closing on January the 31st if 
Bill 70 passes. Other Ontario craft distillers are looking to sell their products internationally instead of right here at home because it doesn't make sense financially. Speaker, this government should be doing everything it can to support small distillers, to support new manufacturers, and to support growing sectors of our economy. Can the acting premier explain why, instead of helping Ontario's craft distillers, her government has decided to make it almost impossible for them to succeed? Bring it up, Jerry. Mr. Speaker. The industry has grown 10 times since 2011 as a result of the measures that we put forward. The distillers were well aware of what the costs were involved when they commenced. We are now improving their margins to make it more effective for them. We're having ongoing discussions. We're, promoting, we're providing promotional distribution, Mr. Speaker, enabling them to have access throughout all of the uh, stores going forward. We're providing 1,250 litres of spirits as promotional distribution, and we're expanding their sales opportunities. We are working with the distillers. We recognize the importance to our province. We're making their margins more, uh, improving their margins, and we're working towards doing even more, Mr. Speaker. The distillers know that for a fact. All the industry knows as the changes are being brought forward. And it's the greatest amount of change that we made since Prohibition, Mr. Speaker. We are now providing beverage, alcohol, cider, beer, and wine at grocery stores. And that is a compliment to the entire industry. Thank you, Mr. Take Speaker. Your question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for today's ever popular Minister of Labour. When I look around the. Stop the, stop the clock. I've already spoken to that, and it will not happen again. To the minister, please. I am proud to see so many women representing and working hard for their communities in, in Ontario. Women are present in all in industries and sectors across the province. However, despite our participation throughout the workforce, we know that barriers remain barriers that prevent full participation by women in the workforce. Most notably, women continue to earn less than average than men. I know that both the Minister of Labour and the Minister responsible for women's issues have been working hard to break down barriers that women face. As a government, we believe in the critical role that women play in Ontario's economy and support fair workplace policies and equal opportunities for everyone. Can Question. the minister please inform the House how our government is currently working to close the gender wage gap? Minister of Labour. Karen, thank you to the member for uh, that very, very important question and for her continued to support, uh, support and the involvement that she's taken in this very important issue. Last week, Speaker, was the 30th anniversary of the introduction of Ontario's Pay Equity Act. And what I did on that day, Speaker, was I announced the new working group that's going to deal with the gender wage gap. It's something that the steering committee recommended we do to make practical decisions to move forward on this issue, Speaker. We haven't made the progress. None of the three political parties over the past 30 years have made the progress we should have made on this issue, Speaker. So the working group's got 14 organizations, two community members, Speaker. They're going to represent business, labor, human resources, advocacy groups. This group will be diverse. It's going to have a very wide-reaching network. It's yes, going to sir. provide us with that practical advice and uh, the feedback on how we should be very, very specifically addressing the issue thank of the you. gender wage gap. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for his answer, and Mr. Speaker, my supplementary is for the minister responsible for women's issues. I know that in addition to gender wage gap working group, our government is taking steps to empower women. Women play an important role in contributing to a healthy economy, and it is essential that we ensure that there are economic opportunities for women and all Ontarians. I know that earlier this year our government announced that Ontario will be setting and implementing targets for women on public and private sector boards. Removing barriers to the advancement of women ensures that more Ontarians have equal access to economic opportunities. I have spoken to several members of our faculty and management at Queen's University in my riding of Queen Kingston and the Islands about this issue, and I look forward to meeting with the USA members today to discuss Question. it. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what else is our government doing in this area? Thank you, Minister. Responsible for thank you, Speaker. And I, again, I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for uh, her efforts on this very important work to close the wage gap 
for women in Ontario. We have many initiatives underway, Speaker, which includes creating 100,000 new licensed childcare spaces and, as the member mentioned, ensuring that at least 40 per cent of all appointments to provincial boards and agencies by 2019 are women, and making workplaces and campuses and communities safer through our sexual violence and harassment action plan. In addition to this, Speaker, we continue to support, pro support programs that help low-income women gain new skills and opportunities. Since 2003, for example, more than 2,500 women have participated in training through our Women in Skills Trade and Information Technology Program, Answer. our micro lending uh, program for women in Ontario, helps low income women build and grow their business, and the employment training for abused and at risk women provides women with specialized. Thank you. New question, the member from the PN Carleton. Speaker, my question is uh, to the Minister of Health. Uh, since we last engaged on the Ottawa Hospital uh, 48 hours ago, a lot's changed. The Ottawa Hospital Board last night unanimously rejected the Tinney's Pasture location for the rebuild of the Civic Hospital, and I was pleased to learn that each and every member of the Ottawa Liberal Caucus also endorsed, as I have, the preferred experimental farm site as well. And today, the NCC will uh, will formally ask uh, or provide their recommendation to the Federal Heritage Minister. So with the uh, new information, I'm hoping that the Minister of Health will share his, uh, our position with local health care professionals and, and elected officials on our preferred location for the new Ottawa Hospital to the federal government today. Thank you. Minister of Health, long term here. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question uh, as a follow-up from the one uh, asked uh, before earlier. Mr. Speaker, it's uh, vitally important that any decision with regards to the provision of health care, uh, particularly when it comes to the siting of a new hospital that we're committed to, uh, that that be a community-led process, that there be wide and thorough consultation uh, with the community, that the community board, as represented by the Ottawa Hospital Board, that it plays as it is a leadership role in determining the future siting of the hospital. Uh, that, and I'm gratified, not simply the member opposite, but the, uh, the five members of the Liberal Caucus who uh, represent uh, the Ottawa region and Ottawa itself that are uh, intimately engaged uh, and advocating on behalf of the, this, the, the new uh, construction of the uh, Civic Hospital, Mr. Speaker. Answer. There, was, there was a recommendation provided by the National Capital Commission last week. Uh, we understand uh, that uh, it is now uh, uh, up to the federal government you. in consultation to look at that recommendation. Supplement. Well, thank you very much, Minister. I appreciate your response. And I do appreciate uh, that all members from, from Ottawa support the preferred site at the experimental farm. And the community-led processes have time and time again uh, proven that the best place to rebuild the civic hospital is at the experimental farm. Uh, it is not a community-led process when it is the National Capital Commission. It's unelected. It's unaccountable. And the three members, the only three members from Ottawa actually did not support uh, the NCC's recommendation. So we're asking for your leadership. It's been a long process, and everyone from former mayors and the former CEO of the Ottawa Hospital to our current elected MPPs and the Ottawa Hospital Board have spoken with one voice. Tunney's Pasture is not an appropriate location for the Civic Hospital. As the funder of the hospital rebuild, will the minister commit to not only funding the new Civic Hospital but speaking to the Minister of Heritage federally to ask that the reconsideration uh, of, the, of the land um, go back to the original location? Question. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm confident that with the process in place, uh, the decision taken by the community board of the Ottawa Hospital, the support provided to that board by the uh, five, uh, my five uh, caucus colleagues that uh, represent, along with the member opposite Ottawa and the Ottawa region, uh, the, uh, the process that we have in front of us, including the role of the federal government and the Minister of Heritage, uh, that I understand that the board is, uh, has a very positive and collaborative relationship uh, with the federal government, and in particular the minister and her ministry, uh, with regards to this process. I'm confident that they've established a community-led, community-driven process, including the leadership, driven by the leadership of the Ottawa Hospital Board, a community board, Mr. Speaker. I'm confident that the right decision will be taken. All answer. Time. Thank you. No question. The member from Nickelback. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour le ministre de la Santé. For Ministry of Health. Huh? World AIDS Day. I want to thank the people living with HIV and Ontario AIDS service organizations for their response to the epidemic. We have made real progress, but there's still more to do. Every single year, 800 Ontarians get diagnosed with HIV AIDS. That's far too many. 
we must do better. For nearly two years now, we've been waiting for the minister to sign off on the new plan to reduce HIV infection in Ontario and provide better care for people at risk of infection. Today, we are still waiting. Why is the minister taking so long to release Ontario's new HIV strategy? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we should uh, be proud of the success that we've seen over the past decade, past several decades in Ontario, in terms of uh, reducing the uh, negative impact of HIV infection, the outcomes that we're seeing, both in terms of the prevalence, the, the new cases that we're seeing, which continue to drop in the province, but also with the therapies available, which are turning uh, what was a scourge across the world uh, several decades ago to what is seeing, being seen more and more as a chronic disease. I think the member can appreciate, as we have been developing a strategy for the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker, that it's important that we have widespread uh, significant consultation, particularly with those frontline individuals, those individuals, Ontarians who are living with HIV, those advocates and frontline workers that are supporting them, Mr. Speaker. Answer. That's the consultation that's been underway. We're very close at releasing your strategy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Two years to sign off on a new HIV AIDS strategy is a very long time. Aid service organizations like Richard Rainville from Access in Sudbury are doing incredible work on the front line, but every year that the minister waits, 800 more people's health and lives are in danger. The new strategy is done, Speaker. It is supported. It needs to be released. After two years of waiting, the minister needs to sign off. Will the minister mark World AIDS Day tomorrow by finally, at long last, releasing Ontario's new HIV strategy that we've all been waiting for? Thank you, Minister. Well, that would be a great way to mark World AIDS Day tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. I agree with the member opposite. Uh, but it's important that the public not think or believe that we have been standing still. We have been investing significantly in uh, continuing to provide supports uh, to prevent uh, to treat, to support uh, those uh, living with HIV and AIDS, Mr. Speaker, and primarily doing that through funding these same organizations that are at the front line, the advocates that the member opposite is speaking to. So we've spent, I think, I believe, an appropriate amount of time while we continue to engage and continue to invest, continue to make demonstrable progress. We've, we've taken an appropriate amount of time to make sure that we get this strategy right, a strategy that, in fact, reflects the hard work of those frontline workers, the advice and expertise of those who are living Answer. with HIV, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be releasing that strategy very, very soon. Thank you. Yeah. New question. The member from Ottawa, Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, my question is uh, uh, for the Minister of uh, Consumer Services. Uh, and first, uh, I'm very happy and very proud to represent the people of uh, Ottawa. I was uh, one of the concern, and one of the uh, concern is uh, the proliferation of. Uh, Establishments on uh, pay loans. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, the minister announced uh, new rules uh, to protect the consumer uh, in those uh, transactions with uh, financial services. Uh, consumers that are vulnerable uh, can uh, fall into debt uh, within the, uh, because of those establishments, and this is a considerable uh, uh, difficulty for the family. Mr. Chair, uh, can the minister tell us uh, what is the plan of our government to protect Ontarians uh, from uh, those uh, people who are uh, uh, doing uh, those? Uh, payday loans. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, first, uh, let me agree to uh, welcome the new MPP from Ottawa Vanier. I am very happy uh, to have an ally here, a francophone ally, and I know that she'll do an excellent work for the elected, for the voters of uh, her county. And uh, not only do we have a new MPP who is exceptional, uh, but also highly qualified, and I would like to say 
I would like to thank uh, the uh, MPP for her uh, excellent question, and I am aware of that is a st uh, this is a, an issue that is very important in her writing. Mr. Chair, consumers should have access to an equitable market for financial services uh, that uh, is not unreasonable for them. Uh, this uh, bill, if it is uh, passed, will reinforce the financial protection for consumers. Uh, and Mr. Chair, we believe strongly uh, that we should have an equitable market and well-informed uh, for all Ontarians. Uh, continued work on this issue. It's a very important work uh, for my constituents. I am pleased that our government is taking concrete actions on payday loans, which is something that I hear a lot in Ottawa Vanier. Mr. Speaker, I've heard about the concerns of several members on both sides of the House uh, about how payday loans can be a problem and, and require uh, some immediate attention. We know that payday loans are a last resource for many Ontarians, and we need to make sure that the risk of borrowing is reduced. Mr. Speaker, can the minister update us and provide further details in her plan to strengthen consumer financial protections? Again, a big minister. thank you to the member from uh, Ottawa Valley for the supplementary. Mr. Speaker, if the proposed legislation is passed, a rulemaking authority will be able to set out standards that lenders must take into account when determining a, borrowing, a borrower's ability to repay. It will restrict <laughs> High frequency borrowing. It will provide repeat payday loan borrowers with an extended payment plan option and improve enforcement powers to address unlicensed lenders. Mr. Speaker, I know that people sometimes need to borrow money to pay their bill. People that have bills to pay may have to. We need to maintain accessibility to these short-term loans while helping ensure that at-risk Ontarians do not fall into debt trap. Sir. Should Bill 59 be passed, Ontario would become a national leader in taking actions to better protect consumers from the risk of payday loans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question, the member from Kitchener, Thomas Hogan. Yes, uh, Speaker, to the Minister of Health. Uh, Speaker. While this government tries to convince Ontarians we've turned the corner on ER wait times, a recent initiative from Grand River Hospital paints a different picture. Residents in KW are being asked to foot the bill themselves to reduce ER wait times since patients are waiting longer than they should. Really? Speaker, in a letter to neighbours, the Hospital Foundation indicates we do not have enough ER doctors to serve our growing community. But it's not too late. While the government's funding has failed to meet ER demands, the letter explains that your gift of $30, $50, or whatever you can will help us bring more emergency physicians to Grand River Hospital. Wow. Speaker, can the minister explain why Kitchener-Waterloo residents are being hit up with fundraising letters to support ER Good needs question. that her government has failed to provide? Wow. Good question. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. What I can uh, uh, tell the member opposite is that since 2008, when we first introduced our ER uh, strategy to reduce wait times in ER, and we began, Mr. Speaker, by actually publishing and making transparent and available to the public what those wait times were, which is something that the uh, party opposite, the official opposition, never did, Mr. Speaker. But what we saw since 2008 is an improvement in the wait times. Uh, for an, and a, a decrease in the amount of time that Ontarians have to, to wait in their ERs. And there's a recent report that I referenced earlier from the Fraser Institute that showed in recent years, despite an increasing population, increased visits to our ERs, an aging population with more complex uh, conditions, despite all of that, we are continuing to see a decrease uh, in the past uh, seven yes, years, eight years, Mr. Speaker, a decrease in the wait times, both for the, uh, the high acuity visits as well as the yeah. less acuity visits, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mm, yeah. Thanks, Speaker. I'll send him over a copy of the letter so he knows what I'm talking about. So, just last year, Grand River Hospital had to cut 68 staff, including 23 nurses, due to the government's lack of support. That sounds familiar. This year, they're having to go hat in hand to the community just to meet our ER needs. As the fundraising letter explains, over the past few years, we've tried very hard to cut wait times. Doctors have shifted their hours and staff haven't ensured efficiencies in patient flow. And while they've done their part, the letter notes that each year the ministry only funds one ER resident, and this is not enough to meet our shortage. To help cut wait times, please give today. So, please give today. will the minister tell us what we can mark him down for? $30, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50, $50
fifty dollars. What do you give me? Will he, he provide whatever what he can your to support ER needs at Grand River Hospital in Kitchener Waterloo. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, here's what you can count on me for. You can count on this government for $1.379 million for Grand River Hospital Corporation that I announced just last week, Mr. Speaker. Just last week, almost $1.4 million for Grand River Hospital. That's in addition to what we announced in our spring budget, Mr. Speaker, which was $345 million, including funding for Grand River an additional $140 million over the, across this province. So, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to our hospitals, as evidenced by the almost 3 percent, Mr. Speaker, increase in operating costs for budgets this year alone. That investment will help with ER wait times. It will help us make even more progress than what the Fraser Institute Answer. demonstrated to us, that we are decreasing wait times to the point where we are among the best in Canada. Mr. Thank you. Speaker. The member from Scarborough, Agent Park, on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have two very special guests here visiting us at Queen's Park, Pamela Hart and Lisa Powell from the Anuyan Native Women's Shelter who are here today for the annual, third annual shoebox drive. I encourage every member to come and participate. Thank you. On a point of order, Speaker, I noticed in the uh, public uh, East Gallery today the leader of the Green Party of Ontario, Mike Schreiner. Welcome back to Queen. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in a point of order, if I might be able to correct my record from this morning uh, in response uh, uh, to a question from the Leader of the Opposition, he did ask the question to me back on October the 8th, 2015, and I want to make sure the record was corrected. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Okay. Member from Essex on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I, I just noticed two friends from the Labourers International Union North America, Jason Audi and Jason McMichael, are here to join us today to see the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. I beg to inform the House that I have today laid upon the table the 2016 Annual Report of the Office of the Auditor General of Ontario. We have a deferred vote on the Notice of Motion No. 5 relating to the allocation of time. I keep hurting my neck turning this way a lot. We have a deferred vote on the notice of motion in number five relating to the allocation of time of Bill 70, an act to implement budget measures and an act and amend various statutes. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. Tuesday, November 29, 2016, Ms. McCharles moved government notice of motion 5. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Renacki. Mr. Renacki. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bernetti. Mr. Bernetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dick. Mr. Dixon, Ms. Manga, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Ms. Domerla, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassic, Ms. Jassic, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Ms. Albanese, Ms. Albanese, Ms. McMahon, Ms. McMahon, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Ms. Verniel, Ms. Verniel, Madame. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. <clears throat> Please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ernest. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Madame Jalina. Madame Jalina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The eyes are 52, the nays are 38. The eyes being 52 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred on the motion for closure of the motion of second reading of Bill 59. Same vote. Same vote. Same vote. The eyes are 52, the nays are 38. The eyes being 52 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Um, Madame Lalonde has moved second reading of Bill 59, an act to enact a new act with respect to home inspections and to amend various acts with respect to financial services and consumer protections. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carry? I heard a no. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Madame Lalonde has moved second reading of Bill 59, an act to enact a new act with respect to home inspections and to amend various acts with respect to financial services and consumer protections. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Nafti. Mr. Nafti. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barnetti. Mr. Barnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Arzetti. Mr. Arzetti. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassick. Ms. Jassick. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martins, Mrs. Martins, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Ms. Verniel, Ms. Verniel, Madame de Rosier, Madame de Rosier. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Oosterhoff. Mr. Oosterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Co. Mr. Co. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Madame Jalina. Madame Jalina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. I just wanted time to be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 90, the nays are zero. The ayes being 90, the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, does your lecture close the door? Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister. I would ask the bill be to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.